com a Guimarajó. E o trabalho desse coletivo, é, tem, tem, durante o longo do tempo, a gente tem se debruçado, sobretudo, é, em fazer com que a comunidade local entenda cada vez mais a importância desses objetos para a nossa história, para a nossa vida. Uh, the work of the collective, uh, uh, sorry, Arte, Arte Mangue, which means art and uh, mangrove. Eu perdi aqui. Pode repetir o que você falou. O coletivo Arte Mangue Marajó, né, o trabalho que a gente faz, mas esse trabalho tem sido muito importante né, uh -huh. para a comunidade, para a gente entender a importância né, uh -huh. da, nossa, da nossa ancestralidade para o momento atual. So the collective uh, is of great importance to understand uh, the, the, the roots of the history of the, the culture. É, as esculturas que estão aí em exposição, se vocês tiverem oportunidade de olharem, Uh, the sculptures that are, are downstairs, if you have a chance to look at them, Como acho que foram mostradas aqui, like the ones that have been shown here, elas têm é, uma referência é, da pajelança. They have a reference to a pajelância. Pode explicar, fala um pouco sobre pajelância. A pajelança é, 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 o, é o médico indígena, o, é, o curandeiro que recebe a, a dádiva de curar através das ervas. Uh, a pajelância é the is the healer uh, who is received with the gift of healing with through herbs. E através é, é da, da pajelância tem muitas referências na minha obra, como por exemplo caruá. And through a pajelância, it has a lot of references in his work, like a pajoá. Caruá. 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 O caruá é um indivíduo que está tão compenetrado, está tão próximo da natureza, tão junto, que passa a ser um só. O the caruá is an individual who is so connected uh, with the nature that he becomes one with it. Então, na minha observação, é, principalmente das, dos povos que é, sobrevivem da, dos, dos manguezais, da catação de caranguejo, de molusculos. And through him, the, the people who survive in the mangroves, uh, eating, uh, searching for uh, all the, 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 the creatures that live there, like crabs and fish and all of that. É, eles vivem numa relação muito íntima com a natureza. Que, que eles exercem essa atividade é, por, por longas é, é, vidas, já de, de muito tempo, e conseguem estabelecer isso de forma muito harmoniosa com, com o ambiente, they, sem depredar. They develop a very strong connection with the, with the, the, the region uh, whilst doing this for such a long time and they develop it in a way that it's harm, uh, uh, harmonic and that it doesn't uh, deprey the, the region, the, the, the nature. I observe that some alguns caranguejeiros, que são os trabalhadores do mangue, entram, adentram nos manguezais, é, ficam todos sujos de da, da lama, da argila, e e se dilui no ambiente. Uh, some of the caranguejeiros, who are the people that work in these mangues, uh, they get so covered in the, the mud and all the other things that you find there that they kind of dilute themselves in the, in the mangue. E daí vem a minha inspiração é, de representá-los é, nas obras, é, com formas é, de água, é, de raízes, e da figura humana também. And that's how he gets the inspiration to uh, portray them as such, as in a way, like they were covered in water, like in, in a very liquid way with roots, much like it is the the biome. É, essas civilizações que habitaram a Amazônia, sobretudo o Marajó, é, deixaram muitas boas é, referências é, para para a gente, pelo menos na minha leitura. The civilizations that uh, inhabited the Marajó, they, get, they left us a lot of great references, especially for him. 
Eles é, melhoraram o solo, né, segundo a pesquisa arqueológica. They uh, improved the soil through the uh, as is shown through their archaeological research. É, espalhar espécies de plantas. They spread uh, plant species. É, desenvolver uma uma cerâmica muito rica. And developed a very strong ceramic. E eu considero que hoje é, nós temos temos muito que aprender com eles. Uh, he believes that today we have a lot to learn from them. Porque eles estabeleceram uma relação muito espiritual e harmoniosa com a natureza. Because they establish a very uh, strong and har harmonious relationship with the nature. Então eu penso que para a gente no município onde eu moro é, Qualquer modelo de, 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 de desenvolvimento eh, ou de envolvimento econômico deve ter como referência a esses povos que habitaram lá. Uh, that's why he believes that any in he, in the place where he lives any kind of economical development must have in mind the 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 structure that was created by these people, the the idea of harmon harmonious uh, living with nature. Então as obras que, que eu faço hoje, elas estão é, muito impregnadas é, desse pensamento, dessa possibilidade de viver de forma harmoniosa com o lugar onde a gente vive, para que a gente possa permitir que as próximas gerações que virão possam também usufruir desse ecossistema, dessa natureza, da cultura, da arte, de toda a riqueza que existe. Uh, that's why his work is so inspired by the by this culture and uh, with the idea to preserve it as to preserve our the future of of the humanity in a way that they can enjoy the nature the culture the art and everything that we see being shown here yeah. okay well this is a dialogue, and I was going to take the Karua, which is very inspiring idea of the, the nature and the human beings as one, as one same thing. And I would like to invite Glenn Shepard to the conversation, well, um, taking this inspiration of Karua and talking to us a little bit about these deep uh, inter relationships between humans and natures in the Amazon region, Amazonian populations. <clears throat> Thank you all for the invitation. Um, you know, looking at, at his sculptures and thinking about those sculptures in relationship to the Maraja ceramics, um, it, it makes this, it's not an explicit uh, connection with modern indigenous peoples, but there's a clear continuity because when you look at the mythology of all indigenous peoples of the Amazon, um, there's this idea that in the past everything was human. And then through time, through these different mythological stories, these different human tribes were turned into animals and plants. But even, but despite these transformations that, that created the biodiversity, Basically, biodiversity used to be cultural diversity. They were all tribes. And then that cultural diversity was converted into biodiversity as certain peoples turned into trees and animals. And so there's this idea in the Amazon that there's a, there's a relationship between cultural and biodiversity, that humans and animals are, are connected. And, and those animals and plants that in the past were people and then transformed into their current forms, they maintain to this day an invisible human form that shamans, the pagelancia, the sh which is shamanism. So one of the roles of shamans is to interact with these non-human beings, whether they're plants or animals or spirits, but under our stars, celestial bodies, but underneath that non-human appearance, there is a human essence. And so what's beautiful about his sculptures is the way they, they materialize in the current day through his observations of these 
you know, they're, they're not indigenous peoples, considered indigenous peoples today, but they are descendants of indigenous peoples who work in the mangroves, who gather, who gather uh, you know, crabs and mollusks and fish and so on. But there's a continuity, there's a cultural continuity in the sense that these are humans who have roots, they're, 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 part, they're part tree, their roots are tree roots, physic I mean, literally in these sculptures. And they, they live in the mud, they cover themselves in mud, so they're, they're like crab people at the same time. And when you look at the iconography of the Marajal and other Amazonian ceramics, there's these human-animal transformations, they're called zoomorphic figures, you can't tell, it. they're part human, they're part animal. And so you see in his art, in dialogue with these ar archaeological ceramics, how this, this, there's this living indigenous cultures that maintain a, a, a physical continuity between animals and humans and plants, and it's, and it's expressed so marvelously in, the, in these sculptures of his. Um, I would also uh, like to, to highlight that um, the replicates that are on exhibit downstairs, they bring an extra challenge and an extra layer of meaning to the archaeological pieces. These archaeological pieces, some of them with 800, 900 years old, or even 1,000 years old, they are resignified by uh, local communities. They are, uh, they are under studies, they are under interpretation, they are under resignifications, and they replicate themselves. They present an extra challenge, which is not just to create some school work, but it's to create a copy of it. Uh, um, and con considering the clay, how it dries, the paints, how they react to the, to the fire. So transforming the clay into an artwork is a challenge in itself, but making a copy of it, it's an extra challenge. And it's been um, used by museums and communities to uh, outreach purposes, to make, uh, the, to make the archeological knowledge, the indigenous knowledge available to schools, available to exhibits like this one here in New York and in several other parts of the world. So they increase accessibility of um, knowledge regarding past Amazonian cultures. Um, and then, um, although Ronaldo here, he, he's very, he, he brought his very personal work and interpretation, um, the, 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 the collective where he works with, they are all inspired in this extra layer of knowledge on the archeological pieces. They keep some on exhibit in their in their um, um, workshop. So people collect the archaeological pieces, bring to him. He shows this, shows them to to visitors. He shows them to the to to his colleagues, to to people who come to his um, workshop, and this inspires new layers of knowledge, new layers of meaning to these pieces. So these pieces that are over a thousand years old, they are still alive. They gain live through this interaction with local communities, with local peoples. So I'd like to hear a little bit more from Ronaldo, how the inspiration from the archeological um, designs, the pieces that kids bring to the, to, to, his, um, to the, his place, how it affects his work as an artist, but also as the, co the leader, of a community leader that cares about his community. Ao longo do tempo tem sido é, um desafio do, do meu trabalho. É, for time has been a it has been a, a challenge of his work. É no primeiro momento justamente a gente tentar é, socializar esse conhecimento com a comunidade, com as pessoas da próximas. 
first is it's been a challenge to uh, socialize this uh, art with the his community and his region. É, a gente recebe é, alunos da escola pública no ateliê. Uh, they, they receive students from public schools in their uh, workshop. Sempre com o intuito de poder é, ajudá-los a, a entender melhor a, a, a nossa origem através da, do que a gente faz, da, através da produção da cerâmica, através das obras, das peças arqueológicas que a gente tem lá no espaço. Uh, to better help them understand uh, their, who they are through, by showing them the pieces that have been made by people, and ancestral people, but also the works that have been done today by him. Porque, é, na minha opinião particular, o meu encontro com a cerâmica é, ressignificou a minha vida. Uh, for him, his encounter with ceramics has re uh, given a new meaning to his life. Entender que eu tinha uma origem, tinha um começo, e para a gente pensar no futuro é preciso a gente entender como é que foi o caminho no passado também. He started to understand that he has a, an origin, he has a beginning, and that in order to understand who we are, we have to understand that as well. Então a, a, a nossa vida tem com o trabalho com a cerâmica junto à comunidade tem sido esse esse essa simbiose que que, que aparece nas peças também, né? Ela So his work with the ceramics and the community it's been this symbiotic relationship that he, that is shown by his work. É porque é, provavelmente a produção da cerâmica arqueológica na ilha pelos nossos antepassados era uma representação do seu universo espiritual uh, because uh, the works that have been done by the, the in the past they were in a way a, a spiritual representation of their identities at the time e, e poder manipular o barro é, para a gente também é uma relação espiritual com a natureza and being able to fold the clay is an, as, as well a, a, a spiritual connection with nature o meu processo, sobretudo o meu processo criativo, é, é muito intuitivo. Eu não tenho nenhum um, nenhum desenho, nenhum esboço para fazer as peças. His uh, work is very intuitive. He never has any sketches or ideas of what he's doing. He's just... Eu vou deixando a, o, o barro guiar as minhas mãos. He, he just lets the clay guide his hands. E com isso as, as, as obras vão ganhando vida. Sempre inspirada nesse ambiente que a gente estava falando agora da, da importância da preservação da, da, de uma relação equilibrada com o lugar e a, a natureza. Uh, and always, uh, in this way, that the, his work is, gives life, and, but always remembering what we were saying about the connection of uh, the human and the soul with, the, with nature. Okay. So um, Ronaldo is sharing with us um, his experience, and we can see by his words that he is deeply connected to this region, which is um, Marajo, through ancestrality, and he brings uh, all the inspiration from and through ancestrality and deep connection with um, the earth of Marajo. My colleague Glenn Shepard and myself, we are not we are Amazonians by heart. We were not born there. Glenn Shepard is from it's North American actually. I'm not originally from um, the Amazon region, but both of us we chose the Amazon to be our home, to raise our families and to give uh, our works to this region. And I would like to talk to you, Glenn, a little bit about the challenges that are um, working in the Amazon today. We, are, we all know that Brazil faces, although we're hopeful now, uh, Brazil faces serious struggles 
relating um, to indigenous communities, but also to the environment and to the survival of research institutions themselves. And so, researchers. And researchers, yeah. So yeah, we, we, I know we share, um, I would like to share with the public some thoughts about this as well. Yeah, because you know what, we're scientists. And, um, and one would think that science is something that everyone can get behind, but we're finding, we found out these past four and something longer, eight, six years, that um, some political groups see scientists as a threat because scientists want to talk about things like indigenous people's rights, um, uh, global warming, um, biodiversity, conservation and there are political and economic groups that don't want to hear those things. And one of our very close friends, um, Bruno Pereira, was murdered doing that work, working with indigenous peoples. We, we, were, we, both, we, we were his neighbor. He would come to our house for cookouts, he and his wife and, his, and then his two children. So we, we were personal friends with, you probably read about the, the horrible story last June where uh, uh, an indigenous a rights worker was murdered in the field for doing that work, for protecting indigenous peoples against uh, land invasions and illegal fishing and illegal mining. I've worked in, in, in regions where there's illegal mining and uh, looking back, you know, taking journalists, just like he was doing, taking journalists to document illegal mining reporters for the New York Times, for the Financial Times, and that could have easily been me. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a personal war against researchers and indigenous peoples and traditional peoples. And there's also an institutional war where our research institutions, um, it, you know, in, in the, from 2021 to 2022, the science budget in Brazil had already been cut back a lot. It was cut by 93% in one year. It was already cut back to nothing. So, you know, we're hoping with the new administration that there'll be some more funding for science. And we've seen, you know, we've seen the impacts of these budget, and you know, the past four years were particularly bad. But it's not restricted to the past fours. It's it's a it's a trend that's been going on for quite some time. And we saw the the, the National Museum burnt down to the ground in 2018, and we lost priceless, you know, uh, human artifacts and plant and animal specimens, including Marajal ceramics that the Geldi Museum had lent to the National Museum, tw you know, in the 1920s, and those were lost. And you know the oldest skeleton in the Americas lost in the fire, or partially, mostly lost in the fire. And so there's 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 been this process of cut funding cuts to science, scientific institutions, scientific research, um, indigenous the people who protect indigenous territories. And you know with the loss of the National Museum, you would think that the nation would respond by, oh, we need to protect our museums. It's been the opposite trend, and we can see in projects like this. How, I mean, there's a, there's a tendency by the public to see museums as sort of cemeteries for dead objects. You know, extinct animals, Tyrannosaurus rex, extinct cultures, indigenous peoples, their, their archaic, their primitive technologies, their, their ways of dressing themselves. So there's this idea that museums are this, this storehouse for these old artifacts, extinct cultures, sort of a curiosity for people to look at, but not, as if they have no relationship with modern people. And we've seen through this project how the, the presence of these objects preserved in these institutions for scientific purposes, but they've also served a, a purpose much beyond science, science. You know, they've been preserved for thousands of years in the ground, and then the museum, the Gelding Museum, uh, archaeologists took them out of the ground, you know, 50, 70, 100 years ago, 20 years ago, and they're preserved in the museums, and they're inspiring a new generation of artists and, and local people um, with new ideas about these old objects. And we see the same process not only with these artists, but with indigenous peoples. Um, I've worked very closely with the Kayapo indigenous people. We we're just talking uh, beforehand with some of the, with some of the, some of the, the people, the staff here, about um, how the Kayapo indigenous peoples came to the Geldi Museum for the past 10 years and looked at the objects in the museum and they said, well, it's important for us to see these objects and document these objects. But what's more important is for Brazilians, for people outside and people outside of Brazil to know that we still know how to make those objects. And those objects are still alive in, the, in our cultures. And so what they asked me is, can you give us cameras 
and teach us how to make film so we can, we can show the world that we're not just museum specimens. These objects are still living in our, in our cultures. We still make them. We still do the ceremonies with these things. And so in this sense, it's important to realize that these museums, they aren't just warehouses for dead objects. They, they, indigenous peoples maintain a living connection with those, with those objects. And, and for indigenous peoples, he sort of alluded to this in his, in his talking about how you know, the, the inspiration to make these things comes from, comes from sort of a shamanic inspiration. Indigenous peoples don't interact with these objects as objects. They interact with them as subjects, as people. You see that in the Marajo, if you noted the, the, the artist who took the photographs, she was incorporating the, those Mar Marajo burial urns. They are people. They are, they are people with their ornaments and their body paint in which human remains are left. And in the same sense that these archaeological artifacts are subjects, are human beings, the indigenous peoples who come to the museum interact with those, those objects as living beings, as spiritual beings. And so uh, I think all of this, um, you know, given the political context of the past four years and a, a larger trend in Brazil for defunding you know, museums defunding science, we see how these objects, they have a relevance to living peoples. They're not just dead objects. And I think it's really important for the public to understand that and for the funding agencies to understand it. And that's why I really thank the, the, the America Society for allowing this opportunity to show how museums and science are important for the current world. Yeah, and I would like to, to bring Ronaldo now to tell, share with us about his experience um, in a partnership, I, I think, well, because we are in a struggle and we are all in a struggle, um, several struggles actually, the way we, we fight all these threats is by giving hands one to the, to the other. It's partnerships. What we see by these works, the replicates and the collaborations is the way we survive, the way we get together, we hold hands and we survive. And I would like to hear from Ronaldo how he sees the partnership with, um, the muse with museums, with the Gaudi Museum, but also there is a museum in Marajo Island and how you see the potential of um, these partnerships in order to uh, make ourselves stronger, stronger for this fight. Aproximadamente é, 20 anos, que é a idade do meu filho mais velho, a gente tem um trabalho na comunidade onde eu moro, um trabalho social. É, Approximately uh, tw for 20 years, they have a social work that they do in their local community. Que fundamos a Associação de Moradores do Bairro do Pacoval, que é a comunidade onde eu moro. Uh, they have an association of the, the people that live in his community. What, what is it called again? Pacoval. Pacoval, the, the neighborhood of Pacoval. É, nesse espaço, dentro desse espaço, a gente, através de muita luta, de muito trabalho, a gente conseguiu formar ceramistas, músicos, poetas, é, e e envolver a comunidade num trabalho coletivo de entender que é possível a gente mudar as coisas através do trabalho em união, trabalho em conjunto. Uh, in that space, they managed to create, uh, help people find music and ceramics and show them that they can uh, produce it and use it as a, as a mean to uh, grow together. E durante ao longo do tempo a gente tem é, ido em busca é, sempre de aumentar essa rede e juntar a parceria para cada vez mais a gente intervindo na história e melhorando a nossa realidade. And they are always looking to expand that partnership in order to uh, find a better way to improve their reality. Eu entendo que é parte da nossa vulnerabilidade muitas das vezes. Uh, part of their vulnerability sometimes. É muitas a gente não entender de fato o nosso papel na, na Terra. 
It's not understanding our role on earth, on this land. E esse entendimento vem, se dá também no entendimento da nossa história, da nossa origem. And this understanding comes from the understanding of our origins and our history. Que vai muito além do capital. That it goes way beyond the capital. Mas é uma relação humana de cuidar do outro e cuidar da terra. It's a human relationship of taking care of one another and taking care of the land and of the earth. No bairro onde eu moro, é, não tinha absolutamente nada é, de política pública, absoluta, absolutamente nada. In the neighborhood where he lives, there used to be no type of public service. E depois de toda essa trajetória, hoje a nossa comunidade é uma referência de arte e cultura no município. And even despite all that, uh, nowadays his community is a is a landmark in culture and yeah. E isso graças ao trabalho, é, sobretudo, é, das parcerias com o Museu Milho Guilde e agora com essa oportunidade de estar aqui dividindo com vocês essa minha a, a minha história, né? And, <laughs> And that is mostly due to their partnerships with the museum Gaudi, and also partnerships like this one, and to be here with everyone today. Um, okay, um, you met Ronaldo mentioned um, caring, caring about each other, caring about the environment, caring about the community and most importantly, recognizing legacies from uh, the ancestors, legacies from the, who came before and what um, was left to the community. And when we look at the Amazon from the point of view of archeology, span we see it's not only about the art or the artistic works, but it's about the environment and the nature and the Amazon forest itself as a legacy from past Amazonians, from past cultures, who, Ronaldo mentioned, improved their soils, creating what we call terra preta de índio or anthropogenic dark earths, which are highly fertile soils that are human made by past Amazonians. The forest itself, it's also result of management of past communities, past um, societies that lived. We saw some images of Marajo mounds, what we call tesus, which are in fact true engineering works, earthworks that provided food, that provided ceremonial living, that provided um, areas. So it, the, the ponds that are related provided fish. So all these are legacies. We see them on, on the landscape today. And this landscape is a result of such past Amazonians, past Marajuaras. And I know Glenn Shepard's been working a little bit about um, this as well, if you'd like to add something. It's a very important point. Um, for the longest time, there was the assumption that when, you know, when, the, when, the, when the first Europeans came to the Amazon, it, there was very little human population, indigenous human populations there. And the, the naturalists, the great naturalists, you know, uh, Wallace and, and Humboldt, they went through these landscapes. With they, with, with they, they saw this pristine landscape, this landscape that was untouched by human hands. And for the longest time, that idea dominated in the literature that the Amazon was somehow a landscape with very little human impact on the environment, and it was sort of a living Eden. And um, what we've realized over the past, and very recently, these discoveries have really been made over the past 20, 30 years, is that actually there were very large human populations in the Amazon before European contact, and it was really the decimation of indigenous peoples by exotic diseases, by warfare, by displacement that reduced the, the population, the human population of the Amazon by 90, 95 or more percent. And so that pristine, unoccupied environment that the early explorers and naturalists saw was not a natural environment. It was a, it was a, it was a Holocaust environment. It was the result of the death of millions of people. And as archaeologists have overcome this bias towards Amazonian past, um, you know, everywhere else in the world, 
you had hunter-gatherers became agriculturalists, started building pyramids, and you had civilizations and cities very quickly. In the Amazon, we, don't, we thought we weren't seeing this because, but it just happens that the Amazon, there's no stone. There's very few stones in the Amazon. And, what arche and, and this, this sort of blind eye that archaeologists, they s assumed that there was no large civilizations, lo no large cities in the Amazon, so they didn't look for them. And there was no stone, so they didn't look for them. But as archaeologists in the past uh, you know, 20, 30 years, the stones of the Amazon are earth. There, there's no stones there. So the, the, these monumental structures that are built in the Amazon are made of dirt. So there's these mound builders, the actual agricultural soil, this incredibly fertile agricultural soil that's still used to this day is a legacy that the indigenous peoples in the past left us. And all of these examples of how there were large indigenous populations managing the environment in these very intense ways that are invisible to modern eyes because of bias in, in looking for stones and looking for cities and also the, the demographic demise of these peoples. And so in this, this, this is another sense in which museums and, and science are important, not only for documenting and preserving the past and for providing these opportunities for contemporary present peoples to come and be inspired by museum, but also thinking about the future of the Amazon. If large numbers of people could, had li who lived in the past in these Amazon for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years, managing the environment, making the environment more productive for humans without destroying it, couldn't we learn from that in, the, in this new wave of development for the Amazon? Rather than cutting it all down and planting soybeans and raising cattle, maybe we could learn from these past practices and current practices to have a more sustainable future for the Amazon. So it's another element of how museums and science and this sort of collaboration is important for the past, the present, and the future of the Amazon. Um, in order to make this little, this conversation a little more a dialogue, I would like to invite you um, to ask questions to Ronaldo, to Glenn, or to me, then to, yeah, yeah? yeah. Uh, I want to pick what you just said. Um, I'm Brazilian, and I'm very frustrated because I know much more about the history of it almost any other country than about Brazil because of the lack of materials. So you were mentioning um, research done um, in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, where we can read about? So if you guys can suggest some material for us, I would be very happy about it. Thank you. This is a very good point. And it's mainly, well, one of the things why we thank so much the American Society and the consulate to, to make this encounter possible so we can start talking to the public here in America about such histories and knowledge that's been ac accumulated for, for a while now and it's not always available to the general public. Of course, there are several publications, but they are very academic and, and somehow restricted to universities and restricted and not open in both local communities or broader audiences. And this is how I, why I see the potential of exhibits of filmmaking of books for, for general public, and indeed there are, I invite you to visit the, the website of the Gildi Museum. There are books also in English, some of them available for download. But this is, is a very good point, and I do agree we need, we still have a path to run to make all this knowledge uh, available to the, to, to, to the general public. But a very good place to start, a friend of ours, Graham Townsley, just made in the past few months a film for, was it for, was it for National Geographic? CBS. 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 Made a beautiful film called Ma Mountain Builders of the Amazon? No, no, what was it called? It was called First, I, I can't remember now, but it's on public television and also on the YouTube. 
It's called, what is it called? Anyway, it's about the, it's about the mound builders. It, it's a, it, what, what, you gotta find the name of this film. But anyway, it, it, it's, it's a recent film that because of all, I mean, wh whenever you see reality TV, it's all about, oh, indigenous peoples living, you know, living uh, primitive and uh, no con Ancient so, civilizations and, of the Amazon. And, uh, ancient civilizations. That's and, it. And so this film tries to undo this sort of stereotype of the Amazon as this un uninhabited place. And there are, there are interviews with archaeologists, including beautiful cameo with Elena here. Uh, I call her the Angeline jo Jolie of Amazonian archaeology. And, um, and several prominent Amazonian archaeologists from Colombia, from Brazil, from the United States. And there are some images on Marajo Island. And um, archaeology done by indigenous archaeologists. There is a whole new generation of archaeologists who are getting their degrees right now and who are indigenous themselves. So they are making their own histories and this is all it's a very sensitive very it's a very good way to 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 get into this world of archaeology what archaeological knowledge is today which which is very different from 20th century views of Amazon as pristine as a greenhouse and all these this old fashioned so it's views. called uh, ancient, ancient civilizations, civilizations of the Amazon yes. on PBS. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, let's say, when you talk about living collections, it remind me of a story that one of the co-directors of the Lenape Center here in New York was talking when he visited the collections of the Natural History Museum and he saw Lenape corn. And he is in the process of rematriating seeds from these corns. And so I wanted to know if the Goeldi Museum, let's maybe say, is there a bias in ceramics? Like, are there any other types of collections, such as, you know, seeds that could be rematriated? Or what other types of collections, when you mentioned the masks, right, are in the process of not only being accessed, but being used and reused, right, in these different ways? <clears throat> well, in the case of the of the ethnographic collections, this was exactly a project that I did, you know, about ten years ago with Kayapo and Baniwa, um, indigenous collaborators. The the two oldest and sort of most you know most numerous and oldest collections in the, in our in our exhibit are the Koch Rumberg collections on the Upper Rio Negro by Theodor Koch, Koch Rumberg from Berlin, and then the um, the Fregio collections among the Kayapo, and so. Uh, we, we brought in indigenous um, collaborators from these two indigenous nations to look at these collections and reflect on what they meant to them. And it was a very interesting um, experience because, because of this idea that they didn't interact with these things as dead objects. They were living objects, and in, in some cases, they were dangerous objects. They, they were, they, the Kayapo, it just so happened to coincide, coincide when they visited the museum. It was right when the H1N, the, the swine flu virus was going around. And the Kayapo were, they were afraid of getting sick from these objects because they say they have this power, they have this odor, that strange odor. But they, as they were traveling to the museum, they saw everyone wearing masks to protect themselves from H1N1. They said, well, if it works for, 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 for H1N1, it'll work for these spirits. So they all went into the museum with masks and gloves, and they interacted with the objects, but they were, they were very cautious because they thought those objects could come back at them. And we had one object in particular. It was an um, anteater dance mask from, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago. And it had deteriorated. It was falling apart. And, and the curator said, well, can you repair this mask? And they, go, they, were, they were like, why would we repair it? When we finish the ceremony, we toss it out and let's make a new one for you. And so, you know, we have this sort of the, the, the museum curation kind of fetish with keeping these old objects and preserving them. And the whole point of, Kai, of the Kayapo culture is the important thing isn't to keep it in the museum, it's to keep the knowledge alive so we make them. And so they made us a new one and did a ceremony to show how it was alive. And so there were, there were, there were these very curious sort of contradictions between our concepts of what an object is and their concepts of the subjectivity of these objects. This is, so um, this idea of living objects, it's, it's, it's something that, that not only we as curators pursue, 
and promote, but it's it's something that is it, 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 it's part of the cultures. With the Krenak, which are who, indigenous who live south um, in Minas Gerais and in central Brazil, they come up to Belém so they can have their idol out from the collection to take this necessary sun so he keeps healthy and being healthy the community becomes health themselves so this is something that is more common with ethnographic collections not only at the Gilgi Museum but in general but also with archaeology um, we have a project with the Kuikuros from the Upper Shingu who come to the to the, the archives to come to the collection. Uh, we open the, them together and they tell us how to store, how what the names and the functions and everything. The Upper Shingu is a very special reason, region because it's got very strong, very remarkable cultural continuities from pre-colonial to cultures today in terms of material cultures, objects used and holds in the community. So they, t they teach us, they tell us how to, to work. But it's not only restricted to indigenous uh, peoples or to continuities. We see living objects when they are in close contact with, with local urban communities, with artists. This is also a way to, to make objects speak, to, to listen to what objects have to, to tell us through their hands, through their works as well. I don't, maybe Ronaldo would like to add something about this idea of living objects um, in collections. Na verdade, é, eu, eu quero falar que da nossa relação hoje com com essas heranças, né, que nós recebemos. He wants to talk about uh, this inheritance that we received. De aprender com a avó, com o pai, é, qual determinada para que determinada planta serve. Of learning with a, a, a grandma, with a dad, uh, what each each plant serves for. É, poder cultivar no meu quintal é, o meu canteiro com plantas to be able to grow in his garden the, these plants antes mesmo de eu vim para cá a minha companheira estava com gripe right before he came here his companion was sick with the flu e eu tratei dela com as plantas que eu tinha no quintal and he treated the, her with the plants that he had grown in his backyard e a nossa preocupação é ensinar isso para os nossos filhos também. And his concern is that we teach this to our children as well. É, para que é, esses saberes, essa nossa conexão com a Terra e com nossos antepassados não desapareça. So that this uh, knowledge and this connection with our forefathers isn't lost. É, quando eu falo da, quando eu estava falando da, da pajelança. Uh, when he was talking about a pajelância que é esse dom de, da cura através das plantas. That is this uh, gift of healing through the herbs. Ela está no nosso dia a dia, na nossa relação com o nosso dia a dia também. Yeah. It's also something that you see in the day to day. E a nossa preocupação é justamente a gente manter isso. And his concern is that we keep this alive and well. Porque eu acho que dessa forma a gente consegue ver de, de, é, de maneira mais equilibrada para a gente poder projetar o futuro that we can uh, find this in the, using this as a way to project a better future. Porque nós humanos, a gente não consegue viver sem as, é, sem os elementos vitais que vêm da natureza, como por exemplo, a água e o ar que a gente está respirando agora. Because as humans we cannot survive without the the, the essential bases of nature like water and the air. Então, é esses, esses objetos vivos eles estão no nosso passo a passo no nosso dia a dia. So this li these living objects they are in our daily lives and our uh, everyday lives. E poder escutar os nossos mais velhos os, os que detêm os conhecimentos e poder fazer com que ele possa repassar esse conhecimento para os mais jovens 
e a gente conseguir se manter dessa maneira. It's listening to our elders and being able to pass down what they're saying to our youngers and keeping this not line of law knowledge uh, safe. É, esse tem sido o, o grande desafio, né? E é um desafio para o futuro. A gente não pensar em é, se, se for possível colonizar Marte, né? Mas <laughs> so, this is our challenge right now. It's, it's, it's not thinking if we can colonize Mars. Mas é a gente continuar vivendo aqui na Terra, né? But how can we keep living here on Earth? This was a beautiful message, Ronaldo, and I think we can close um, with with this message to the public. Thank you so much. Uh, please join us in the reception next room, and thank you so much for the panelists. This was amazing. <laughs>